It's a struggle to explain why artists do the things they do. And this is doubly the case when talking to non-artists. There are unique traits, qualities that certainly have definitions and explanations, but translating those notions to someone who lives in a totally different world is difficult. For many of us, this makes life harder. Our parents, perhaps our partners or spouses, might not be artists, and certainly our friends and family can't all be cut from the same cloth. And whilst this difficulty is palpable, I want to start this discussion simply with this. Don't expect non-artists to understand you. I usually start these podcasts by defining the terms of our discussion. Today that becomes a little tricky. How do I go about devising a definition of artist, let alone non-artist? Humans have been struggling with the concept of defining art for eons, and yet, even given this continual discourse, there is a fundamental, emotive quality to being an artist. If you are listening to this, chances are that you identify yourself as an artist, and chances are equally good that you identify many people in your life as being non-artists. However, for the sake of reference, let's craft a definition. An artist is a person who partakes in the creation of art for personal or professional means. This desire may come from a fundamental human need to create, the seeking of joy, or the pursuit of innovation. A non-artist, then, is one who does not possess these and other ethereal and cosmically unidentifiable qualities. I'm glad we've cleared that up. Let's go ahead and start with the lack of understanding between these two groups. Why does this happen? The perspective of the artist is a unique thing. Many artists have a desire or joy in creating that is not present in all people. I know some may disagree with that statement, but it should go without saying from an internet man that my thoughts, ideas, and perceptions, opinions, and all of those other things are exactly what you're listening to. They're mine. They're my opinions. Fortunately, they are hemmed in by some amount of humility gained by many years of looking like a buffoon and from the experience of working with thousands of students and artists over the last 10 to 20 years. Caveats out of the way. I really do not see that everyone is or will be an artist. This creates a fundamental difference in the perspective of the two types of people we are referring to then. One that sees the world through an artistic lens and the other who does not. As artists are likely in the minority here, we tend to be looked at as the abnormality, as the ones who are different. Humans, as we unfortunately know, are prone to look down on, demean, or even think themselves better than whatever faction they deem as different. Artists have been the subject of this thought process for much of our shared history. We function differently. It is subtle in some cases, but it is enough for people to notice. We tend to be introverted. We tend to enjoy long periods of time doing the same thing. We tend to be excited about things just outside of the normal things that people get excited about. And the list goes on. The point here is that our perspective as artistic humans is fundamentally different than people who are not artists. And that shapes and frames every piece of this discussion. The second reasons that I want to touch on is the misconceptions and the stereotypes. Non-artists often expect us to be many things. And unfortunately, when you are looking for something, you tend to find it, even if your finding of it is not entirely accurate or unbiased. I believe this phenomenon is called observer bias where your expectations about your potential findings tend to inform or influence those actual findings. Many people on the outside expect us to be eccentric and weird. And of course, there is some truth to this. We all know this from our lives. These stereotypes get represented in the shows that we watch, in the books that we read. Uh, Thinking about Shallan from the Stormlight Archives by Brandon Sanderson. Thinking about Sai from Naruto, uh, the manga and the anime. There are so many representations of artists in popular media and in our storytelling that just represent us in a weird light, as eccentrics, as weirdos that are just a little bit different. Uh, To be fair, when I was in high school, I was part of the anime club where we would get together once a week and we would play card games and we would watch anime. Almost every kid who was a part of that was an artist. And back then, manga and anime were not very widely accepted. There was no mainstream version of it. Dragon Ball Z kind of existed in the mainstream, but not really. And uh, you got flack, basically. It was not something that was ever seen as cool back then. And so you got flack if that's something that was a part of your life. But all of the kids who were into those things were also the kids that were into art. 
And when I went to art school, because I went to art college, I spent four years, actually five years to get the two degrees there. And my time was spent with all manner of artists. The school that I went to had the full range. I went for graphic design, but they were drawing students, painting students, sculpture, ceramics, metal smithing, blacksmithing, fibers, um, and probably others that I'm forgetting. Oh, printmaking. My one of the printmaking professors was a fantastic guy. But all kinds of artists from many different walks of life. Uh, the photographers were actually some of the ones that were f the most interesting to me because they didn't seem to be uh, consistent. Whereas there was a consistency to the painters, there was a consistency to the drawers. And this consistency showed up when you hung out with over a hundred of that particular kind of student. Likewise, the art history nerds were, were their own breed. They were different. But I got to see this eccentricity and weirdness, if you want to call it that, on a daily basis for many, many years. And it's true. <laughs> there is some strangeness to artists. They tend to dress a little differently. They tend to care about different things. They tend to listen to music that's on the fringes. There seems to be an overlap with the countercultural nature of artists and musicians, which makes some sense. In fact, we actually refer to the two groups frequently as artists, regardless of whether we're talking about music or the actual making of uh, physical tangible art. I see overlaps with the punk rock crowd that I ran with when I was in high school. I spent the first couple years of my high school experience playing in a punk band and uh, the kids that were involved in that, and I say kids because we were all like 14 to 18 at the time, all of the people involved in that had a tendency to be artists as well. And we dressed weird. We wore wristbands and shirts under shirts and put stickers in all kinds of weird places and drew on our arms to fake tattoos, all kinds of stuff like that. But we were a little eccentric. We were a little weird, a little strange. We played a lot of video games back when video games, again, weren't very mainstream. They were a little countercultural. And there was always a, a strong nerd streak to us as well. A lot of us did engineering classes and Odyssey of the Mind and things like that. But there, it was this eccentricity and it exists there still. You know, I taught in the public schools for the last, well, about two years ago, I got out of teaching in the public schools, but I taught in them for 11 years. And the artists, especially when they kind of isolated themselves at the end of high school, they were a strange breed. And even nowadays, they dress differently, they listen to different music, they have a high propensity of being the kids that are in drama, that are in music, that are staying after and doing funny things, that are making goofy videos. There's a propensity for artistic people to just be a little outside of whatever the normal boundaries are for society. And so this stereotype is true, but part of the damage, I think, comes from the fact that people then expect those things when they're not there when the person is just being their normal, everyday self. Sometimes the outsiders expect us to be dreamers with our heads in the clouds. And this is different than the eccentricity and the weirdness. There is a propensity for artists to sit in their school classes and to draw and to sketch and to kind of fade out of the existence of that reality for a time. It was very frustrating to my teachers when I was growing up because I would often be listening to what they were talking about, but I would be sketching and I was drawing. And many teachers thought that was disrespectful. I got chastised for it a lot. I moved a lot in my classes. I, I had a hard time staying still. And those kinds of things earned me flack. If I was able to just sit there and pay attention and you know look like every other kid in that classroom, I wouldn't have gotten quite as much flack from my teachers as I did but I was always dreaming, I was always conjuring things. If I was playing Zelda Ocarina of Time, which I was in middle school, if I was playing that in the evenings, then while I was sitting in my history class listening to a boring recitation of dates, I was probably running through the water temple in my mind, trying to figure out where that last key was and how I was going to get through it. This is something that I saw in my educational experience as a teacher as well, and something I actually talked to other teachers about. Sometimes they would have students that would be sketching like I did when I was young and they would complain about it. I would try to talk to those teachers and let them know that there are certain kinds of people that just don't pay attention well if they're focusing on a singular thing. That some kinds of people pay attention better if they're moving with their hands or if they're drawing things. And so I tried to push those teachers to ask questions of the students instead of isolating them and, uh, and embarrassing them. Just ask them a question like you would any other kid in the class. And most of the time the feedback came back, well, man, I thought so-and-so wasn't paying attention, but I asked them a question and they nailed it. 
And it's like, yeah, right, because that's that was what I was. And not every student is this way. Some students are so bored by what's happening there, or they don't like that particular class, or they've got other things they're dealing with, and so they just want to draw. And that is understandable, and that's a less acceptable reason. But the dreaming, the daydreaming, the having your head in the clouds, thinking and processing all these additional things, it's a stereotype that gets assigned to us. And sometimes it's real, like I've described, and sometimes it's a detrimental cloud that gets thrown over us. It's a box that we get put into. Sometimes non-artists expect us to be solitary and introverted. And this is for a good reason. But the difference is that solitary has a much more negative connotation to it, almost like being a hermit or a recluse. Whereas introverted is just a state of being, like some humans are introverted, some humans are extroverted, and most are probably somewhere in between. There are tests like the Myers-Briggs with certain levels of accuracy, um, and I'm sure some of you have taken those before, uh, but they will give you some idea of how introverted or how extroverted you are, and they can be of varying levels of help for some people. But the, the idea that all introverts are the same is just a, a misnomer. It's not true at all. Neither are all extroverts the same. You know, everybody in your life is some melding of those two, some melding of extroverted and introverted and ambiverted. And it's, we're just unique, we're unique creatures. But the expectation for artists is often that we don't wanna socialize. We'd rather hang out in our basements or lock ourselves in our rooms. And the reason for this is not because we're antisocial. The reason is often that we're introverted it's hard to pay attention to the things that we want to put time into, like writing or drawing, when people are asking us questions constantly. Not all drawing requires a lot of concentration, but a lot of the daydreamy type stuff I just mentioned, the things that are really exciting to us, does require some level of concentration. I don't do my best drawing and painting when I'm hanging out with people, unless we're all working together silently. If my friends and I are hanging out and chatting, I'm not going to be able to get anything that's really brainy done. I can shade things, I can continue to fill in fields of color, but I'm not gonna be particularly good at thinking through something. Even the little drawings that you're watching take place in the background today, these are drawings where I, I had probably a little bit of music going and that was it. I'm just thinking about how this thing functions, what it looks like, how the light would affect it. And that requires some mental capacity. And I can't do that when I'm around a whole bunch of people, especially if they're talking. So the solitary nature of artists, that expectation that we are going to exclude ourselves from the social interactions is true in a sense, but it's often true because what we want to do requires silence. It requires the exclusion of other people for a time. And also, if you just look at the fact that many of us are introverted, we get overwhelmed by the amount of time we have to spend with people. If you're very introverted and you go to school, you're in high school or college, you are being social to some level all day long. And when you get home, of course you need some time to recharge. And if you have most people in your life who are extroverts, they're not really gonna understand that. They're gonna think they understand it, but they're really not. Um, and American society, at least, is really built to the advantage of extroverts. And there's almost this sense that, oh, you're introverted? Like, we'll, you know, we'll work on that. We'll, we'll try to fix that. And <laughs> that's, that's not a good way to look at it. Some humans are just different, and that's fine. There are, of course, negative differences that you can have as a human, but this is not one of them. Introverts are not inferior to extroverts, nor are they superior. Uh, we are just different. We are just a different brand of human. But that expectation that we are going to exclude ourselves, especially if it comes with a negative connotation, can be damaging for us as artists. Sometimes these expectations stretch into damaging places with the expectation that we struggle financially, that we are narcissistic, that we are impractical, that we are even attention-seeking. And I frankly don't want to keep going down that path because it's going to be a whole podcast of negativity, and that's good for no one. The whole reason I bring up this concept of the expectations of others on artists is that sometimes there is a misconception disconnect that happens when people outside the art world look into it. They expect to see one thing, and so they see us as that. It may be accurate, it may not, but most of the time they will see or choose to see an exaggerated version of reality. We are introverted, but we don't necessarily want to crawl into a cave and hibernate all winter long. We are not attention-seeking most of the time, but when we are excited about something, we want to show you and we want some input. 
Stereotypes are often exaggerations of reality and are painfully common when it comes to artists. But understanding that component might help you to understand that people looking in from the outside are not necessarily trying to be hurtful. They may just be misinformed and relying on their misinformation instead of looking with clean and clear eyes. Another reason for this disconnect can be a difficulty in relating. For better or worse, artists tend to be a little strange. I wore weird clothing when I was in high school and college, like I mentioned earlier. I listened to any music I could find that didn't show up on MTV. I have never listened to the radio. I skateboarded, I loved anime, and I played card games. I did anything I could find that would make me a little bit different. Going to art school, I found many people of the same kind. Kids, for the most part, who loved being expressive, who tried out new things, new lifestyles, and wore the strangest clothing. The irony here is that if we had been doing that just to be countercultural, just to be different from everyone else, when all of us got to college and realized that everyone was doing the same nonconformist weird things we were, we probably would have become more extreme or we would have stepped away from them. And I never saw that. I wore the same strange or different clothing that I did even when I realized that other people were doing the same thing. I never personally cared about sticking out. There was something about perhaps sticking it to the man from my 17, 18, 19 year old self, uh, which you know wasn't wise, but it also wasn't really detrimental either. But we didn't change when we got to college. People didn't continue to exaggerate that and try to be the one person who stood out the most. Like we kind of stuck with these weird trends that we set and these things that we found important, which I think flies in the face of the idea that, well, we're just, you were just kids seeking attention. That wasn't it entirely at least. We tended to look different from afar. Our habits tended to be weird and a mix of awkward social engagements and long periods of time alone working on our art. We can be, as artists, a little bit strange for some people to relate to. And this can lead to some people to struggle to relate to us and can struggle to understand who and what we are. And if you don't interact with a particular kind of person, a particular kind of thing, you tend to just form opinions and those opinions stay solidified. They don't change. This is one of those things that I've mentioned to a lot of people, especially when you finish college, if you, or sorry, when you finish high school, if you have a chance to travel, a chance to get out of the place that you grew up and go see how other humans live, you gain an understanding that the way that you grew up is not how all humans grew up. This sounds really elementary, perhaps, especially if you live in Europe or you've traveled much in your life, you understand that the way that people live in Montana is not how most humans live. But the problem is if you don't travel, if you don't get out of your normal very often, then you have that as an almost innate understanding because it just goes unchallenged by anything. I live in Colorado. Colorado is pretty much in the middle of the United States. And I have been floored over the last 20 years by how many people have never even left the state of Colorado. And then the massive percentage of people that have like never seen the ocean or never been to another country. It's crazy to me. And again, I'm a little privileged. I grew up in the military. I've traveled a bunch. My dad was a pilot. So I got to travel a bunch when I was younger. But even if you don't travel that much, getting out of your state, your province, your country, if you live in Europe where the countries are much smaller than they are over here, uh, you get an understanding that different people live different ways. And I think that's really, really important. Here in the United States, if you live in Oregon, if you live in Indiana, and you've lived there your whole life, and most of your family lives there, then when you have somebody in your life who is an artist, who is a little bit different than everyone else, it's easier to cast judgment on that person. It's easier to struggle to relate because you haven't had to struggle to relate to other people before. When I've gone to other countries and I realize obviously they don't all speak English and I shouldn't expect them to speak English, it puts me in a situation where I have to struggle to relate to people and they have to struggle to relate to me. When I've gone to big cities, when I went to college where people were not all from Colorado, there was struggle there. But through that struggle, I grew as a person. I think most of them grew as people as well. And you understand that the way that you grew up is not how most humans grow up. I don't know that there is a most humans grow up this way, right? We, we come from so many different places in the world, so many different climates, so many different religions and cultures that probably the majority of humans is like 17%. Like most humans grow up this way is like 17% of humans. And that's that massively dwarfs all the others. Like the way that I grew up is probably like 4% of humanity has grown up this way. So all of that to say that struggling to relate to humans is a very human thing. 
and it extends to us as artists. And so if you run into this in your existence where you feel like people are struggling to relate to you, understand that it's not your fault. It's not hinging on you. It's hinging on the person who's struggling to relate. And we get better at relating to people by relating to more people and relating to more different kinds of people. Let's move on to something fun. Insecurity and fear of judgment. Sometimes non-artists can feel quite daunted by the prospect of engaging in conversation about something they understand so little about. Sometimes this takes the awkward place of, they talk about it as if they do understand it, and it becomes very quickly apparent that they do not. But often this also comes out in the form of very brief comments that delve only into the most shallow layers of the art itself. We run into this, and this really isn't much of an issue. It's a kind of an awkward interaction that we sometimes have with people who pretend to understand the intricacies of what we're doing. This might have to do with subject matter. It might have to do with the medium itself. You start talking about oil paint and they go, oh yes, I, yeah, hmm, yeah. And then they throw out a couple comments about, you know, mixing water in there or, you know, something that basically, I'm like, it's occurring to me now, of course, that they have water soluble oil paints, but they didn't when I was doing it. Uh, when I was in school, but they might just mention something that indicates like, oh, like you're, you're being kind to me right now. You're talking to me, but you don't really get this. And that's okay. Uh, it was agitating to me a lot when I was younger because I was more arrogant and more proud. And I think I took a little bit more of a stance of, you know, you respect me and respect this thing that I'm doing and you don't get it and don't pretend to. But you know what? There's a lot of things I don't understand and a lot of things I don't get. And I've tried to not pretend that I do. I, it's okay to be ignorant. It's, it's, it's bad to pretend to not be ignorant when you are, but I don't think there's anything wrong with just acknowledging that you don't understand the finite components of industrial thermodynamics. I've got friends who are chemical engineers. I don't understand really what they do. I could tell you a little bit about what they do, but I don't really get it. I have a friend who is a satellite engineer. I don't understand what that means. <laughs> like, I don't understand what the day-to-day -day was with that. And I certainly don't need to pretend that I do get it. So that's just this kind of funny thing that happens. And, uh, and, and it happens because people don't want to feel like they're left out or they want to acknowledge you, but it's mostly harmless. Alternatively, though, sometimes this insecurity comes out in a way of casual or wanton disregard. It is all too easy as humans to demean that which we do not understand. In fact, you can still see this happening in popular media today. Postmodern art, which many simply call modern art these days, is often abstract, countercultural, or non-representational. To the casual observer, this form of art often looks like paint thrown on a canvas or large fields of colors, and sometimes it's just altogether indiscernible. This form of art is outright mocked by many, with the common phrase, my child could do that, echoing through their chambers. Art, especially art like this, is often difficult for those outside of the artistic world to understand or to value. And this gives rise to a subgroup, a group of people who do not really understand it either, but in a desire to fit in, applaud such art as high class, innovative, or genius. The reality is very complicated. It is fine for someone to think a piece of art is ugly in the same fashion it is fine for someone to think a piece is beautiful. Outside of the artist though, and others like them, it is difficult to understand the trueness of that piece of work. So we get these odd phenomenons of people who don't understand an artist or don't understand the piece of art. Some pretend to, some try to be supportive in this pursuit, some don't get it and they feel awkward about the fact that they don't get it and so they denigrate it, they put it down, they're demeaning and they're unkind about it. And these are just human reactions. They're not great, um, they're not always terrible, but they're not great. And they're just things that we can kind of understand and wrap our heads around and feel a little bit better about our particular positions. I can understand how a house is built, how one sails, or how a pilot manages a plane. I can understand those things on an intellectual or an academic level. This does not mean I really get it. At the end of the day, I am too divorced from that world to fully grasp the reality. And though I do not practice judgment from my own insecurity in that field, all too often it happens when it comes to art. So how can we respond to these things? How can we respond to the reality that non-artists are going to struggle to understand us? That some people in your life who you really wish would validate you, would understand you, just might never get you. Let's start with self-acceptance. Your weirdness or lack thereof is not really anyone else's issue. It is yours. 
Come to terms with who you are as an artist and work on accepting yourself. It can be difficult to feel like you don't fit in or you have some manner of natural component that is different than your peers, but you are not alone and you're really not all that weird. We as artists don't make up the majority of reality, obviously. We don't, we aren't the, like most humans are not artists, I would say. Maybe, maybe someone in the comments thinks differently. That's fine. Let me know. I would love to hear about it. But my reality, my interaction with thousands of students and with many just normal average people throughout my daily life is that most people are not artists. This doesn't mean that most people couldn't be. Maybe if life worked out in a more idealized fashion, more people would be, but it feels like it's a pretty small percentage of the populace who are artists in a real sense. And then probably a smaller percent that are that weird kind of artist that has to create compulsively or they just slowly go crazy. We just don't make up the majority. I often call artists weird, especially when we're talking about these things. It's mostly an affectionate term. I don't mean it in any demeaning way. I refer to myself as being weird in this capacity and weird just meaning not the normal, not the average of a given situation. I do not think artists really are strange. We're just simply a little different compared to most people. And this makes life more beautiful. If everyone was like us, um, it wouldn't be great. And if everyone was not like us, it would also not be great. Like we need a variety of people, a variety of things in our life to really make life worth living. You can also focus on beauty. Take pride in what you bring into the world. Artists, maybe more than any other odd faction of humans, are dedicated to producing and bringing things into the world that make life better through beauty and often beauty alone. We have the unique task, not of making shoes or providing shelter, not of governing or transporting, but of producing things of beauty. We are the zenith of culture and society, the wonderful peak upon the tower that only gets to exist because other people made it possible. Our task is to produce things that make the lives of others better, things that bring smiles to faces or make people consider their decisions more closely. It's only because society is in such a place that we have that opportunity. And it's a wonderful, beautiful thing. And I think you could also make a good case that even when life is excruciatingly hard, that art still continues to add some life, some encouragement to things. Music has done this for eons when you look back in human history. But I think that there's a, there's a true element to that in just all of our art today as well. I may be leaning in heavily on this angle, but I suppose it's likely okay. After all, most artists are so hard on themselves that they could likely use someone pushing recklessly in the other direction. Calling artists the zenith of culture and society is a little bit bombastic, but it's, it's kind of an interesting way to think about it. And it might be totally wrong, but we're not going to get very far if we don't try to set out some standards and try to work on clarifying some things. Try to dial back resentment and animosity. It doesn't help you. It might be justified, don't get me wrong, but it will not give you anything beneficial moving forward. If you feel like the people in your life don't understand you, people are denigrating you, they're making fun of you for being an artistic person, lashing out at them is not going to help you in any capacity. And it's certainly not going to create a different sense of thinking about you in their minds. Your time is likely better spent building fences rather than catapults. Concentrate on bolstering your defenses, keeping yourself safe, and try to ignore the things that lead to resentment and animosity. You can't control them, the other people that is, so your efforts have no tangible guaranteed benefits to them. You can control yourself and your responses, and overfixating on someone else and how they do things is just not going to help the situation. This comes from countless times in my own life, from working with students, from being a student, and from working with many people in that same boat. Realizing that you control yourself only and that it is not your responsibility to solve those issues for others can release you from immense pressure. Lastly, there's a good chance they will never understand, so don't waste your time. Your resentment is like an engine. It consumes fuel and energy, and it will benefit you little, even if it is justified. Try to focus on what you can do, not on what other people who may never change can do. Sorry if you hear little rattling sounds. I think we have a woodpecker on the side of the house right now. This next thing I think is really important and it can be quite difficult to do. Cultivate empathy for others. It's not that they need your pity, but even if they do not strive to understand you, I think you can benefit from trying to understand them and what makes them tick. 
Empathy, like forgiveness or humility, is a thing you practice personally that extends outward. The action is beneficial to the recipient, but almost more so to the person who extends it. If you forgive those that make your life difficult, who judge you as an artist, whether they deserve to or not, you benefit from that. You let go of some of the chains that those people placed upon you. Now again, this does not mean you have to open yourself back up to them, or that the harm that they caused you is now vanquished and it goes away. It is simply the first step in dismantling undue control from that person or from the past. Empathy, likewise, makes your life better when you extend it to others. And in some cases, it can win over a particularly hostile person. Don't accept abuse, though. You should be no one's punching bag. Try advocating. Quiet as we are, advocating can be difficult. This is an essential step, however. As our extroverted brethren do it, often simply by existing, we can help ourselves by interjecting our needs and standing up for ourselves. With family, try advocating your needs and desires, the things that make you unique as an artist. Many parents struggle to understand that their artist needs to have more alone time and that it doesn't necessarily mean they are depressed or unhealthy, but that they simply need time to work. Perhaps compromises can be reached, where you can come into the living room while your family watches a movie or a show, you can don your headphones and work on your artwork. Communication is key here. Not every parent is going to be open to this the first time you have this conversation. And this might be if you're still living at home, and this might be if you're like me, where you've been moved out of the house for 15 years. It's just that communication is the first step in kind of nailing down these things. Well, what about work? In your workplace, try to give accurate representations of the time required for creative endeavors. In addition, try to speak up when you feel like someone is degrading the creative aspects of things. Creativity is hard, it is work, and it is valuable. If you need to kindly remind people of that fact, do so in a professional manner. They likely don't want to deal with the mental fact that they can't do it, and it is being shoved off onto someone else, so take some pride in your capacity to solve problems in that way. In addition, if you work as an artist, charge adequate rates. You are valuable. If people want your services, they ought to pay adequately for them. Don't undervalue yourself. What about in schools? Fortunately, if you are in school for any manner of art, you likely have teachers who can take up this mantle for you. If you find yourself in a situation where there is no art department or no art classes, this might be monumentally more difficult. Advocate for yourself for the artist's needs. If you speak respectfully and kindly to most teachers and people in authority, they will respond reasonably. I was fortunate enough to have a former art teacher as a principal when I was in high school. And in one really interesting and unique situation, I got to see this pan out in a lovely way. We had a display case in my high school for art students to put up their work. Uh, one week, there was a board decision that the students were not very fond of. I don't remember what it was. I just remember that the school board made a decision and we as students thought that it was really dumb and it was really detrimental. It might've been a big deal, it might not have. My guess is that it really wasn't. A friend of mine made a piece of art that depicted the principal being puppeteered, controlled by the, uh, by the school board. And it was really interesting and comical and kind of funny, kind of a political cartoon. And he got our art teacher to put it in the display case so that everyone could see it. And so we did. And I just happened to be in the hall one day when the vice principal came over and was talking to the art teacher. And the vice principal was really upset about this because they saw it as being disrespectful of you know, showing disunity and they were demanding that this piece be pulled out. Well, it just so happened that the principal came over at the same time and he asked what was going on. The vice principal leaned over and kind of explained like, this is what's happening. Like this, this student is representing you in a poor light. They are showing off that you are a puppet and this is disrespectful and we need to get rid of it. And the principal surprised everyone and said, no, 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 you have to leave it up. Like the, these kids have to have the ability to have their, their thoughts you know, heard by everyone else. Like that piece of art is political, it is a protest. And that student has done so in a way that didn't include any profanity. It didn't include anything that was terribly objectionable. It is a political cartoon about me. And I am saying that you have to keep it there. And the vice principal was stunned. And uh, a lot of us were too. And a lot of our respect increased for the principal that day because he decided that even though this piece of art represented him in a poor light, he was unwilling to take away that student's ability to have that opinion and to display that artwork. And so I still think about that today. Like what a, what a power move 
Um, but that, that takes a person who has a, a good sense of self, who understands what kids are and understands how artists function. And he had been a photography teacher before he became a principal. And so he was a lovely addition to our school. I was very lucky to have him. Try seeking support and validation. This is mostly to remind you, dear artist, to surround yourself as best you can with like-minded artists. Find people, a community online, in person, in your classes, where you can work alongside people who have the same desires and needs to create. It makes you feel a little less strange and you will find yourself better understood by people who are cut from the same cloth as you. Art classes in person have this almost by their nature. If you're still in school, I would recommend that you try to take some art classes. Even if you don't really get a whole lot out of the class, let's just assume like maybe the teacher's not very good or something, you are going to get a lot out of being in that environment, being in that community. And it's a really beautiful, beneficial thing. Some of my best memories in high school and in college come from the time in art classes. To be fair, I don't remember what I was learning necessarily. I don't even remember the pieces I was working on most of the time. I remember the camaraderie. I remember working alongside other people, watching what they did. I remember listening to music. I remember fighting over the boombox so we could play our progressive rock songs that were 13 minutes long and while everybody else sighed heavily. I remember those times. They were fun and they were beautiful. And the times in college were great too, when I would hang out working on a project till two in the morning because you can do that when you're in college and just getting to know these people those memories are important. And when I do have time periods in my life, even now where I feel a little bit out of place, a little bit strange because I'm one of the only people in my circles who has to create things to just be a good functional adult, I can go back to those memories in my brain and I can remember like, no, I'm, I'm not strange, I'm not that weird. I just don't have a lot of people that are like me in my close intimate life. Art classes online can do this as well. I've taken several where you actually get to interact. Even if you don't get to use you know, video interacting and chatting in a, in a verbal sense, being able to type, being able to see other people respond. If you can find other artists who do live streams and you can actually interact with them in some way, it's important. It's just a community kind of thing. Even if you're not doing much, if you're just sitting around and you dial into Steven Zapata's live stream so you can watch him draw things, there's a sense of community there. Even if you're not really interacting, you're just listening to him, you know, draw and talk about life and random weird metaphysical and existential issues and maybe answer a couple questions here and there. Those things are really, really beneficial. Now, we've also built a Discord community. We're working on building out that community so that all of us have that space. We're building the community just to be a place for artists to exist, to maybe get some help on their art, but mostly just to have other artists that they can communicate with, to have people who can work alongside them and reinforce that, you know what, like we're all in this together. We're all on the same path and the same journey, even if we have a half dozen different destinations that we want to arrive at. And yes, there are, there are some aspects. When we built it, we, we tried to build in some places where there is opportunity for critique and we try to take that pretty seriously as well. Well, I hope this podcast was not much of a downer. Uh, that certainly wasn't my intent. I just hope that we can be realistic, that we can remember that it is not our duty to make non-artists understand us, and to give them some grace in the realization that it is sometimes difficult to understand us. Peace. That is the goal. And kindness is always a good pathway towards that destination. Well, as always, thank you for your time. I appreciate the listening, I appreciate the comments, and I hope that this was of some benefit to you. Have a good one, y'all. See you soon.